thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan, for joining me as a co-presenter. Uh, it's our pleasure. So the topic of the presentation this morning is understanding the pesticide label and the importance of equipment calibration and delivering pesticides. So Ryan and I will share this. I'll cover the label piece and then Ryan will, will cover the equipment calibration uh, uh, piece. So it'll be kind of two, two separate um, uh, you know, presenters. Um, the agenda, real quick, uh, you could see we're, we're gonna go through it methodically. And as, me, uh, you know, as Ed uh, mentioned, the questions are primarily drawn from the, uh, this presentation. So feel free to follow along and, and take notes. Briefly, uh, what is a pesticide? Um, oftentimes in, in uh, you know, in, in the LCO world, we're so used to the pesticides that we lose uh, track that a pesticide is a regulated entity. So for our business, it's something that is regulated and it falls under the FIFRA 2U, uh, you know, section, which is part of the Code of Federal Regulation 40. So it is highly, uh, I mean, the, the regulators have, have really described what a pesticide is in uh, you know, greater detail. So a pesticide product means a pesticide in the particular form, including composition, packaging, labeling. Um, and so I'm mentioning this to kind of bring up that the pesticide is part of a law. If when you read the text about pesticide, it reads like, a law. If you uh, if you're familiar with laws and regulations, you see here the uh, you know the screenshot, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, known as abbreviated as FIFRA. It really covers uh, section two and three. They go through the definitions and the registration of pesticides. So, um, needless to say, that it starts with the pesticide is part of the law, the Code of Federal. Uh, regulations. So to really understand the, the pesticide label, uh, you want to go back to see the label, the way it is written in, in the law. It's written in, in you know, such a way that it means a license to sell and distribute for the manufacturer, such as FNC, for example. For a government agency, it means the way it will control the use, the storage, the disposal, the distribution, um, and all aspects of, of that application into the law. That's what it means to the government agency. The government agency is commonly known within our uh, TNO and our lawn care industry when we say the Department of Ag. May, it, this may be managed under the Depart Department of Ag, for example, in Michigan. It may be DEP in New Jersey, DEC in New York. So every state has the government agency within that state that manages uh, the pesticide. And then to the buyer and the end user, uh, and many of you are, are, are on the call, are whether end user or buyer or manager, it means it's the main source of information on how to use the product correctly, legally, and safely. Those are the things that are critical. So that is why really um, the label is the law, it's something that you hear throughout the industry and really the source of that label is the law is this document here. Uh, you can plug it in Google or Bing or, or what have you. Uh, just you know, check out label review manual. It's a great resource from the US EPA. I recommend it for managers, operations managers, business owners, etc. because it's a quick reference. It's a PDF file. It's over 400 pages uh, that you can quickly check on anything pesticide related, and it's written in, in such a way that it's easily uh, accessible. So the label, when, when you look at it, it has sections. It was, and those sections are determined in the law or in, in the regulations it, itself. So oftentimes, and again, spent my career in, in, in the lawn care you know, industry, we look at the use rate. When, when you open the label, you go straight to the use rate, looking for you know, the tables. I wanna kind of stress that take the time to review the other section, you know, safety information, environmental hazard, uh, product information, classification, et cetera, it has a lot of information. The use rate is obviously something that determines how you're gonna use the product. 
but I want to urge my my colleagues in in the industry, um, you know, check out the label sections briefly because sometimes they look the same, and sometimes there's a statement about the use. It could be wind speed that's hidden, or it could be temperature inversion, or it could be drift avoidance, or it could be the pesticide container has to be disposed of in a different way than than other pests. So, and the, all of those are written in in the label. So that's why you see a lot of times in presentation, must read and follow all label directions carefully. So that's on, on the label, uh, you know, standard sections. Um, so there's a lot to cover when, when you look at the label sections. I chose the, what is drift? Why uh, drift is, is important? It, because there's more and more scrutiny by the government agency. And as I stated in, in the beginning, the label is how the government agency regulates or manages pesticide use by, by the users. And drift is something that's putting our industry um, sometimes in a, in a difficult light or a challenging light, particularly with uh, in communities or uh, localities in many states, uh, some, some in the Northeast, some in the Midwest, where um, folks are saying, well, we need to restrict these pesticides or we need to ban them or we need to do all these kinds of things. A lot of times they stem from complaints about drift. So drift by definition is either physical drift, meaning droplets land on a non-target uh, site or vapor drift. So that's really the, uh, the definition of, of drift. So let's talk about the physical drift. Physical drift would, would, would occur generally when the applicator is, is, is applying the product, right? Depending upon the equipment riding or, or spraying by, by hand and the wind speed move the application or move the spray swath uh, from point A to point B. It could be, uh, it could be impacted by temperature. It could be impacted by humidity meaning relative humidity in the atmosphere, or it could be impacted by uh, inversion. So uh, the relative humidity, for example, on humid days uh, with wind speed, there isn't much of, of a drift, but on dry days where, where the relative humidity is very low, there's higher risk for droplet movement. Uh, so the physical drift is something to watch for, not only on the applicator, it, himself or herself managing it, but also weather conditions can cause the drift. Um, have you seen this before? If you see a smoke out in, 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 in far in, in the field, if you see the smoke growing, you know, going straight up and dissipating in the atmosphere, that's kind of normal uh, dissipation of that smoke stack. But if you see the inver inversion, is when you see that, and you see it in, in, in the fall or even in, in, in the spring or mornings with uh, under certain condition, smoke, you'll see it go lateral and it forms like a cloud near the, the soil surface. That's what you see on, on the label as temperature inversion. So, and, and this is what, what that inversion means. Uh, oftentimes, if there's no smoke to see it, what I'm, what I'm kind of explaining here, is that inversion could occur and you wouldn't even know that it's happening. So you wanna be aware of the conditions that cause inversions because you don't have visible indicators like this smokestack to tell you, oh boy, this looks like uh, the conditions are right for uh, inversions. Um, so how do you manage the, uh, the drift? Several ways and I think uh, uh, my colleague Ryan is gonna cover some, some of these uh, in, in terms of calibration, et, et cetera, but nozzle, you know, nozzle selection, reducing pressure, increasing the nozzle side, avoid spraying when wind speed exceeds you know, at 10 miles an hour. Sometimes it's in the label, it says do not spray when wind speed exceeds 10 miles an hour or 15. And even if the wind, the label is silent, there's no mention of wind speed, um, the, the applicators are liable for any complaints for on, on, on drift, even if the, there is no wind, wind speed. And it's the right thing to do to watch for, for drift. Look out for 
uh, inversions. There are additives that can reduce drift and you know spread a calibration, and then most importantly, you know, use co common sense uh, from an application standpoint. Uh, you would want to know your equipment. Uh, it goes like you know uh, any trade or any you, you know your your equipment. You know if you're in, into cars, you know your cars. If into shooting guns, you're you want to know your gun. If you're into fishing, you want to know your fishing pole. How, what what it does. Same thing for 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 our business. If you're into spraying pesticides, fertilizer uh, on your customers' lawns, making them look good and everything else, you want to know your your equipment uh, in and out. Um, so. Um, because sometimes things can go wrong in, 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 in a tank. Um, so not only you want to know your equipment, but also you want to know what goes into the equipment. Uh, for example, a tank. Not all pesticide containers are, are the same. So the picture on, on, on the left are two jugs that look very similar. One is a three-way herbicide and one is a non-selective herbicide that's glyphosate. And so this is an error you, you know, that took place. Uh, so not only you know your equipment, also you know your products, what you put in, 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 the, in, in the tank. The pictures on, 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 on the right is a case of a, of a, um, a fertilizer iron pre-emergent uh, that kind of unintendedly, if you will, settle down and looks like this. So the applicator was concerned as to what happened. I'm not getting results. Well, if you combine fertilizer, pre-immersion, three-way herbicide, and then iron, sulfate, um, you want to check that. And I think we covered this um, in, in the last first Friday. So you want to really be, be aware of what goes in, in the tank and, and not only that, but also how to uh, deliver it. Um, so, you want to know your equipment. Also, you want to know the site. Uh, and, and there's the right equation. So, um, so the right equation here, if you have a strip of like four feet or five feet wide next to a hedge, um, you can't really run a piece of equipment on motorized piece of equipment that sits where the nozzles sit at uh, 18 inches you know, above the ground and they're spraying a 14 foot swath. So things can happen. Um, so this picture kind of il illustrate that, that type of uh, um, application. So this is really what this uh, you know, webinar is about to bring some insight to knowing what goes in the tank, knowing the label, knowing your, your site, um, but also there's, there's the right uh, you know, equation uh, to do that. And with this one here, I'd like to turn turn this uh, webinar over to my colleague Ryan Petiti with Green Lawn Fertilizing Company um, to kind of shed some light and give you additional details on the other piece of the equation, which is the equipment and the calibration and how it relates to the label where the label is aloft. Ryan, awesome Ben, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. So before we jump into the details of calibration, I think it's always important to ask the why and define what that why is. Uh, by understanding the why, I think it ultimately motivates us to achieve a desired outcome. So why do we calibrate our equipment? Uh, I think there's five main, I would call it, key areas that calibration impacts. The first is our customers and our reputations, whether it's as an individual or a company. I know for myself, and I'm sure like everyone on this call, one of the uh, main focuses I have is to deliver a superior service to our customers. And when you calibrate your equipment, you're delivering a, a desired results. The second is associate confidence. You know, and, and, and when you calibrate things and ensure that that is being applied properly to your products, you are building pride and you're building consistency in what you're doing. The third is uh, just a reduction in service calls. So. The products we use, they have a label, as Ben mentioned, they've been tested. When you apply them correctly per the label, they're going to give you desired results. That naturally reduces customer dissatisfaction, which reduces service calls, like all goes to the bottom line. The fourth, I would say, is product costs. More than ever, products are super expensive. None of us want to be spending more than we have to on products. 
Um, and so calibrating reduces unnecessary waste and unnecessary cost to yourself and the business. And then lastly, as Ben mentioned, the label is the law. And so when, when we're doing our jobs, we have a responsibility as professionals to uphold that label and follow it to a T. Ben, you can go jump to the next one. So in addition to calibration, the other thing that pairs with calibration is developing SOPs. And SOPs are your standard operation procedures. And ultimately, when you pair these two together, the, it, it will either um, uh, create success or failure uh, from, a, from an application perspective. And, and if we were just to look at this through a different lens, um, and we're looking at other professions, for instance, right? So if you're a plane mechanic, None of us would ever say it's accept, acceptable to be, you know, sort of trained. Sometimes use your checklist. Uh, same if you were a surgeon uh, performing surgeries, uh, if they had no clear procedure. And as professionals, we should be no different. Um, and ultimately, um, we are under a, a fine lens, um, and there's and and we have a responsibility to make sure that we have just clear SOP set um, in addition to our uh, calibration checks. Ben, go ahead. So what do SOPs do? So when you have clear standing operation procedures, it does several things. So it provides clear responsibility. No one's confused at what they should be doing uh, when it comes to our applications and how they should be executing. The other is it provides us a way to measure, measure results, uh, both from uh, an individual perspective, we can see where we need uh, opportunities for development, evaluations, um, and then also that ties then into consistency. So when you have uh, your SOP set up, there is a consistent way then you do your day-to-day uh, -day service, your, your applications, um, and that allows you to quickly define root causes when there is problems, uh, because everyone's following the same page of music per se. Um, improved efficiency, that's a huge one. Um, you know, the more efficient we all are, uh, that, that hits, again, the bottom line, that it's more profit. Uh, and more importantly, it creates time for things money can't buy, family, friends, uh, you know, hobbies, activities that you may have, because you're not spending unnecessary time doing things. Um, and then lastly, and important is just a safe uh, work environment. Go ahead, Ben. So, and if you click it one more time, I think there should be, oh, it didn't come up. So if you back up, it's fine. So there should be several things we're gonna look at here in regards to uh, calibrating a granular piece of equipment. We're gonna use a spreader. Um, and, and the main things you need when you're calibrating a spreader are your piece of equipment. You're gonna need something to measure out your spray grid, a measuring wheel, a tape measure. You need a scale, a bucket, a uh, spray paint or chalk is fine. Just something that you can mark out your grid. And then lastly, something to take notes on um, and record all your data down. Also, everyone has a phone now. Uh, in the past, we used to always say, hey, have a stopwatch with you. You don't need that anymore. Just bring a phone with you because you're going to always have to calculate things out and also get your uh, time measured. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So for this instance, I'm just going to use uh, a granular product 1505. Um, and, and we're going to walk through how you would calibrate uh, you know, your spreader for 1505, if you're looking to put down six tenths of a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So just one thing, if you're unfamiliar, you can figure out your, your spread rate by essentially taking your, your desired rate of nitrogen you'd like to apply, in this case, six tenths of a pound, and dividing the percent of nitrogen into that. And that would give you four pounds per thousand. So that lets us know that's our goal. We wanna put down four pounds of uh, product per thousand square feet also, you can always check the manufacturer's label. They typically always provide guidance on spread rates, uh, spreader settings, uh, et cetera, for the model that you may be using. And that's a great start point. Ben, next slide. All right, so the first step, the very first step you wanna do is gather information on your swath width. Um, so what is that, that spreader capable of, of throwing uh, for a swath width for the product type you're using? And the first thing I would recommend doing is you just uh, mark out 25 linear feet, just a straight line, or just have a start point and end point. Um, and the goal is you're gonna take your spreader, you're gonna put your product, in this case, 1505, I would always use a, about 10 pounds. Uh, put that in there, set your spreader uh, setting uh, based off of what the manufacturer at least recommends, actually gets you in the ballpark. And you're gonna go ahead and walk off that 25 feet with your spreader engaged. And then what you'll do then is you're going to go back and measure the average swath of that of that spread throw. 
And that, that would give us, in this case, we're just going to use the example of 12 feet. So we have a, a, a total swath of 12 feet uh, for the 1505. Now, the spread swath is important, but also you got to understand that when you're using a spreader, there's also something called an effective spray, a spread swath. And that's always half of your total swath. And that's because if you look at the very bottom there, uh, um, there's a little graph. And as you see, the prills, as you go out further from the center of that spreader, you have less density of prills um, and coverage. And so you always have to then throw back to either your tire or center of that pass to get that full rate. Um, and so that's why we always just call an effective swath of, of whatever that, that half number or half of that uh, total swath is, in this case, six feet. All right, Ben. So now that we know our swath width, we can do some quick math. So I always use a thousand square feet when creating grids. And that's because we always want to typically, and especially lawn care, uh, apply something per thousand square feet. So in this case, you just take a thousand square feet, get your total swath width, which is 12 feet and divide it. Now we know what the length and the width of our grid has to be. Um, width would be 12 and then length would be 83.3 in this case. Uh, that gives us a thousand square feet. We'll go and now you would you would essentially mark out your grid. Okay, so now step three. So now we really get into it here, where we're trying to figure out what is that spreader, uh, you know, that spreader setting uh, to be set at to get us that four pounds. So what we would do is you would get your bucket, an empty bucket, and you put it on your scale. You want to zero out that scale. Ultimately, you do not want that bucket's weight included in your calculation. So once you've done that, then you're going to go back to your spreader, empty your spreader out uh, into that bucket, and then you would weigh that, that bucket with the product in it. Um, again, you want a nice even number, 10 pounds. I'm just going to use as an example. That's always a good uh, uh, amount to put in your spreader. So you weigh out 10 pounds, put that back in your spreader. Now, an important point here is this. In this example, typically, you know, you'll use uh, a pavement to, to, to calibrate your spreader for easy cleanup. Um, you want to you want to do a couple test runs and, and figure out your walking speed because when you're walking on pavement, it's a lot easier to maintain a faster speed than when you get into a lawn with a lot of you know lush grass. And so you really want to try to figure out what is the real walking speed you want to be using um, so that you can keep a consistent speed throughout the day. So once you've determined what that walking speed is and what kind of the pace is you want to keep, then you get ready to do do the application to your grid. You want to start back a little bit before the start line of your grid so that you get up to speed before you cross over that start line. Once you cross over that start line, you're gonna engage the spreader and you're gonna walk, and in this case, you can walk right down the dead center of that grid, walk all the way down, shut off the spreader when you get to the finish. You're gonna turn around, remember, because it's 12 feet and our effective swath is six. So you need to go back to mimic essentially a, a, a regular uh, full coverage app. So you're gonna go back and walk across that uh, engaging and shutting off as you uh, get over the start and finish line. Now, it's going to be helpful to have someone there to, to time you because you also want to time how long it took you to cross that 83.3 linear feet each way, um, and that will help you get to your walking speed in miles per hour. Ben, next slide. All right, so now that we've done uh, the actual you know, application to the grid, now we must go back to our bucket and empty out what's remaining in our spreader. Um, and so why we're doing that is because we want to get the weight of what was remaining in there so we can look at the difference and that will tell us what we actually apply to that grid. And so in this case, you know, we just lucked out. We had six pounds remaining. That means four pounds were, was applied to that thousand square feet, which is spot on. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. And you may have to try a couple of different times and get your setting right. So once you've done that and you've determined, okay, I know what my, my uh, setting is and I've gotten the right amount applied to that thousand square feet, um, we have essentially now collected three data points. Um, and so those data points are gonna help us out. We now know our output, our swath width and our speed. Um, and, and the other part of this is when you've determined that, that setting, it's always good to use your keys, your uh, spreader keys and put it down in the, uh, the porthole there to get your measurement and, and on the key and jot that down as well. And then that way you can always go back and reference that for 1505, you know exactly what you be, should be set on. And then this again, goes back to the SOP. You now have consistency because you can now, every single person that goes out and uses this product 
will know what the rate needs to be to apply um, and then how fast they should be walking and all, all that good stuff and the swath width and the, you know having to do six foot uh, passes. So uh, on to the next one there, Ben. So just a quick reminder, uh, especially with a granular, right? Because I said, we typically do this on paved surfaces. At least that's what I tend to do. You always wanna make sure after you do your grade and you do your testing, you clean everything up. Uh, again, being stewards of the environment and being professionals, this is a, a job duty that we should all take seriously and make sure we do each time we calibrate uh, a granular piece of equipment. All right, so the next one is uh, looking at a backpack or hand kit, very commonly used in our industry. Um, and in this case, you would need your piece of equipment. We're going to just say a backpack. Uh, you need a graduated cylinder so that you can measure out your spray volume. Uh, same thing as in, in the granular instance, you need something to measure out your spray grid, uh, a measuring wheel or tape measure, uh, something to measure out your, or actually mark your grid, which is spray paint or chalk or flags, fresh water, and then your phone for a stopwatch. And again, notes, just so you can be noting down everything you're doing here. Ben, next slide. All right, so before you get going into the actual uh, calibration process, the first thing you wanna determine is what type of nozzle are you gonna use? The nozzle really uh, determines three th things, the volume of liquid per minute, the spray pattern and droplet size. Um, ultimately in our industry, when I say our industry, ornamental and lawn, um, we are typically using a, 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 a fan nozzle, a high volume fan nozzle. In pest control, you may go to more of a cone nozzle, um, but ultimately you have to make that selection before you start the process. And then the other thing that I just think it's worth sharing, um, th this is something that I, I just started uh, using and dabbling in. It's a control flow valve. Um, these are reasonably inexpensive, you know, 15 to $18. Um, and they are really great because the one biggest challenge with using a hand can uh, or a backpack is having consistent pressure. Um, because a lot of times you're manually pumping that uh, piece of equipment as you apply. And so this helps uh, keep consistent pressure and a good consistent application. Ultimately, it'll shut off the sprayer if the pressure drops too low. And if the pressure is too high, it reduces that spike of pressure coming out and regulates it. Um, so just a, a, a great, a great uh, tool. Ben, next slide. All right, so I, I would recommend using, and there's other ways of doing this, but uh, when calibrating a backpack or hand cane using the one and one twenty eighth method, and ultimately what that means is uh, it, it equates to one one twenty eighth of an acre. Um, and in this case, to do that, you just mark out 18 and a half by an 18 and a half spray grid. Um, and then when you get your backpack all set up with your uh, water in it, you're gonna pressurize your backpack and then you're gonna go ahead and spray that 18 and a half by 18 and a half foot area um, and time yourself. Now I'd recommend you do this three times. So you're gonna go over that spray grid three different times, timing yourself, jotting down what the, the amount of time it was to get uh, that area sprayed. And so for this instance, we're just gonna say it took 41 seconds on average to spray that spray grid. So now that you know how long it took to spray that spray grid, you're gonna use that time you collected, that 41 seconds, grab your graduated cylinder, uh, go ahead back and pressurize your, your backpack, and you're gonna start spraying into that graduated cylinder for that period of time, that 41 seconds. And that will then allow you to capture the amount of uh, output or volume that that backpack is spraying in that 41 seconds. And so no different than step two here, you're gonna go ahead and then redo that process three times of spraying into that graduated cylinder so you get an average. We're gonna say 21 fluid ounces. So now that you've collected 21 fluid ounces, the one cool thing about the one one twenty eighth method, it, it quickly uh, get, uh, converts. So you go to 21 fluid ounces to, you know, it's gonna be 21 gallons per acre that you would be able to apply. So now the next step would be, you need to uh, do a little math and go, well, what am I actually applying per thousand square feet? I know I'm applying 21 gallons of spray volume per acre. What am I doing per thousand square feet? And so you, tip, you just take your 21 gallons and you divide that by 43.56, right? That's your acre. And then that gives you your spray volume per thousand square feet. In this case, it's just under half a gallon. So now we've got our spray sprayer calibrated. So Ben talked about the label. You need to be able to understand what your spray volume is before you can determine your mix rates and understand what you should be looking at on the label. 
So in this case, I just wanted to show a quick example. So because we're using uh, 0.48 gallons um, and we want to apply 0.5 fluid ounces of tau star, this is tau star for chinch bugs, um, at a, again, at a half fluid ounce rate, I, I can quickly do some math and figure out how much I need to mi mix total of our tau star um, for whatever mix I need, the total quantity. We're just gonna use 10 gallons. So you take your 10 gallons, I'm gonna mix 10 gallons, divide it by your spray volume per thousand, that gives your total square feet. And then you know now I need 0.5 fluid ounces multiplied by my total square feet. And then that gives my total amount that I need to be mixing for that 10 gallons. In this case, it's 10.5 fluid ounces. The other part that's real important is there is certain uh, requirements on the label depending on the spray volume you're applying. Um, and, and Ben was mentioning this. So like, for instance, if I'm under, in this case, two gallons, and I want to do something with this product for subsurface pests, I need to water it in following the application. So again, if I was using this for something other than chinch bugs at subsurface, then I would need to follow that direction. And the only way I'm going to know that I need to do that is by calibrating my piece of equipment. Ben, next slide. So another very common piece of equipment in the lawn industry is a Lesco lawn gun. So uh, with this, you're not gonna have anything different in regards to materials you're gonna use as we did the backpack, because it's another liquid calibration. The only difference is the piece of equipment. So Ben, you can go to that next slide. So the first thing is getting that spray grid measured out. And again, I always, as I say, a thousand square feet is pretty standard. Uh, in this case, you can make it a 20 by 50. And what you wanna do, uh, just as we did with the backpack, is you're gonna spray across that spray grid. Um, and you wanna do that three different times and get your time recorded of how long it took for you to get across that spray grid uh, three different times. So in this case, we're just gonna say it took 60 seconds to get across a thou thousand square feet. And again, no different than the liquid with the backpack, you're now gonna take that time and utilize it to measure out your liquid that comes out of the Blesco lawn gun. Now, you may have a predetermined amount you wanna apply, whether it's a gallon and a half, two gallons, three gallons, whatever it may be per thousand square feet. Um, and so what you wanna do is first, see what that uh, uh, gun uh, is set up to be. Um, let's say it's a brand new unit and you just turn it on, the pump on, and you have uh, water in there and you run it for 60 seconds that's gonna tell you what that output is. And again, you do that three times. Um, if you need to, you can adjust a couple of things to get to the desired gallons. You can adjust the nozzle on the end. Um, and then also you can adjust the PSI on the pumps. All, all these systems now have regulators on them. So you can adjust the regulator and the PSI um, and that can give you where what you want to apply in that 60 seconds. So now that we've got our spray rate, we're gonna say it's two gallons per thousand. Um, uh, we can now reference the label. We know that two gallons is applied per every thousand square feet. Um, and so again, we'll just use 10 gallons. I wanna mix a total of 10 gallons and apply it. So that 10 gallons divided by your two gallons of total output per thousand tells us that for 10 gallons, we can apply to 5,000 square feet. I'm gonna use that same product for chinch bugs. Um, and so we're applying, uh, we're going to mix that half a fluid ounce for every thousand. And in this case, you can see it's drastically different than what we have with the backpack. Um, it's only two and a half fluid ounces uh, for 10 gallons of mix. So this is where, again, it's important to understand your volume of spray because it's going to determine what you're mixing. All right, next slide. So as I mentioned, now you can create your SOP. Um, and in this case, you've got your output which is two gallons, you got your spray swath. We didn't talk about this, but typically it's an eight foot swath. You're throwing side to side, four feet on either side, walking center. And then you can go and, and do a walking speed in this case of about 11.9 seconds for every 50 linear feet. So again, you're now, you have a standard, you can train on it and you get consistent results every time you do this application. Ben, you can go to the next slide. All right, another piece, a common piece of equipment in our industry is a rider unit. So the only difference here, again, it's a liquid, uh, we're gonna uh, be calibrating the boom, so that's liquid. So our materials are the same for the calibration other than in addition uh, to what we just did with the uh, backpack and the uh, Lesco lawn gun, we will want buckets essentially for each nozzle on that rider. In this case, there's four nozzles on this rider. We're gonna use four buckets because we gotta put those underneath each individual nozzle as we calibrate it. All right, so calibrating a rider sprayer. So before you jump into calibrating a rider, uh, because there's several different units out there, always go to the manufacturer's manual 
read through it, understand your piece of equipment. Typically with all these rider units, they provide you a spray chart to, that provides guidance. These spray charts are in, invaluable. They provide everything you need to know. In this case, we're just gonna use uh, the spray nozzle 11004. And you can see there right next to that uh, nozzle, it has a PSI. So again, there's a regulator on these th machines. You can set your PSI to what's recommended at 40. It tells you the droplet size for that nozzle, which in this case is extra coarse at XC. Um, and then you look all the way to the right and you can see that depending on your speed, right? of the unit per thousand square feet, what your total volume is that should be coming out. So that's really key before you start this process because it, it tells you everything you need to know. And then you can just check the machine to make sure it's matching uh, what the, the uh, manufacturer recommends. So we're just gonna say it's five miles per hour we're aiming for. So we should be putting out just over half a gallon per thousand square feet. Ben, next slide. All right, so rider calibration uh, in regards to the boom. The first thing, again, is the spray swap we have to determine. Um, and so in this case, one thing you can look at is the number of nozzles and then the spacing between the nozzles. Um, there's a nice little diagram here. You can see that you know on this unit, we have four nozzles. They're spaced at 20 inches apart. And so effective uh, spray swap would be 80 inches. Um, and that includes your pass back over uh, you know, uh, on the on the end. Um, and so that's your total. So that that equates to about six point, we'll call it seven feet roughly an effective spray swap. So that's really important. You wanna get that number first. Uh, ben, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so so once you've done that, now, now what you need to do is just like we've done in the past here is, okay, we're gonna set up a grid for a thousand square feet. Uh, a nice easy way to do that again is take your thousand square feet do some math, take your, your spray swath, effective spray swath, again, 6.67, divide that in. That gives us 150 feet um, that we need to run this, this, this particular spray grid. Um, and so what you're doing when you do this is you're going to just set up essentially to run that, run that unit across that 150 feet and, and calc, uh, get your time. So how long did it take you to get across that 150 foot spray grid? Um, and so you would do that again multiple times. Just make sure you're getting a, an average. In this case, we're going to say it took 20.5 seconds to run that 150 feet. Okay. Why that's really important is because now the next step is we want to make sure that we're, we have the right nozzles and they're calibrated based off our, our miles per hour. So again, we're aiming for five miles per hour. And so we should be getting right around 1.5 uh, gallons per thousand square feet. So we now take each of our buckets and put them under our nozzles. We're gonna now run the, the pump system on the machine for that 20.5 seconds, that, that period of time it took us to get across that thousand square feet. And, and, and we will then measure out what we got in each of those buckets. Um, and in this case, we'll just say it was 16 fluid ounces per nozzle. So if you do the math on that and you multiply that by four, um, and you can you convert it. Ultimately, that that goes that uh, equates to and should be 0 0.5 uh, 0 0.54 gallons per thousand square feet. Um, and so that's that's a mistake there. It's this fluid ounce, but it is gallons per thousand square feet. And now you you would identify that that unit is set up and ready to go and is ready to apply at the proper rate. Um, and again, you also have tools on these uh, units to adjust uh, spray pressure if needed through the regulator. Uh, if you need to adjust down or adjust up um, your, your spray rate. Um, all right, but typically you always wanna follow the PSI that's on, on the uh, manufacturer's recommendations. Next slide there, Tim, um, uh, Ben. Okay, so now that we've determined the spray rate volume, it's just about a half a gallon per thousand, right? We can now reference the label, the product label and determine our mix rate. Um, and so just as we've done before, we're gonna mix 10 gallons of this uh, uh, product mixture. So we take our 10 gallons of water, divide it by 0.5 gallons, because that's our rate per thousand. That provides us the, the actual uh, amount that we would be able to spray over in a thousand square feet. And then we can multiply that by the uh, 0.5 fluid ounces that we wanna apply for chinch bugs again. Um, and that would give us 10 fluid ounces of towel that we need to mix for er every 10 gallons. Um, and again, this is, this is to ensure that you get the right results, right, for your customers um, and you make sure your equipment is calibrated properly. Ben, I think it's uh, one more slide here. All right, so 
The goal here is ultimately, regardless of the piece of equipment you're calibrating, the three data points is what you're aiming to collect because those three data points will ensure that that piece of equipment is calibrated and you're delivering the desired results each and every time. So output, your swath width, and remember there's the swath width and then effective swath width. You got to know the difference, your speed. Um, and then it, just as an example, so you can see the side-by-side -side comparisons. So we looked at the same label, which was Talstar at 0.5 fluid ounces uh, for each of these uh, pieces of equipment. And we were mixing 10 total gallons. So you can see there's a, uh, there's a variation between these. For the hand can, it was 10.5, uh, 10.4 fluid ounces of Talstar we would have mixed for 10 gallons. The Lesco spray gun, two and a half fluid ounces, so significantly different per 10 gallons. And then the rider unit, again, that could fluctuate depending on our spray volume. But in this case, because we're spraying at half a gallon per thousand, we had 10 uh, fluid ounces that we mixed. So not the same thing, depending on the piece of equipment and how it's calibrated. And then ultimately, as I mentioned, regardless of the piece of equipment, this data will provide you the guidance to clearly calibrate your equipment so you can provide confidence to your teams and deliver the best service to your customers. And with that, I'll end it. So thank you, Ben. All right, thank you, Ryan, great job. I mean, that's a great run through the various pieces of, of, of equipment. And I'd like to add one final comment here before I turn it over to, to Matt, is oftentimes we're talking about overspraying or exceeding the label. And also if you don't calibrate and you spray less than the desired outcome, when you have uh, a lot of service calls, callbacks, et cetera, oftentimes we question is the product performing? We never think of, hey, am I delivering it the right way? Am I achieving? Because if you look at the label, the use rates are very low. You're talking about 0.5 ounce per thousand square feet. That's not a lot of material. So the room for error is not high. Therefore, the precision of the application really drives the results. So Matt, uh, take it over, please. Well, I, I just have a comment on that too. Um, in the field, I get a lot of questions on performance of products. And, and one of the first things I ask is, you know, what was it applied with? When was the last time it was calibrated? And so I have a kind of a follow up question. I don't know if you if you uh, stated it, uh, Ryan, but how often should we be calibrating these machines? It's a great question. So typically, especially once you've got your machine calibrated, it's a very simple process uh, with liquid. Um, the one thing you can do is just do a, bu a daily bucket check or spray into a cylinder. And if, if, if you make sure that that uh, piece of equipment is maintained, it takes no more than 30 seconds to a minute every day just to do a spot check to make sure that piece of equipment is calibrated. And what a small amount of time to save yourself headaches um, and ensure your customers are satisfied with the application you're doing. One, and that's, it, it is interesting just to follow up on that. When we have, um, you know, customers talking about increased prices of product and increased prices of labor and what have you, wouldn't you like to make sure that you are, you know, razor sharp on what you're applying, even the water you're applying for some places, you know, to make sure it's accurate. Um, and therefore, you know, on the resistance side or on the, you know, over applying side, you know, the, the more dialed in we can get it, the better. I will say on a comment on the ride ons, one of the things I've noticed too is we've got some people that are trying to stretch those units to the max square footage. And some of the products that we have on the label says needs to be in 40 gallons or 80 gallons per acre. So I will caution some people as we look through that, make sure that everything lines up uh, in our application. Um, I didn't have any questions in the chat besides one that was kind of not off topic, but a little bit um, uh, in different direction that said, you know, why are some people able to buy restricted use products um, offline? Uh, and use them in their areas when they're registered or kind of restricted in their own state. So I don't know if you want to speak to that, Ryan, or Ben, you want to speak to that? So, yeah, you said, uh, said, you said so restricted products offline, you mean like uh, over the web? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, ultimately, there, there isn't a whole lot of policing, unfortunately. If you go on the web, there is products on there. That even regular, you know, consumers that aren't trained, ha don't have pesticide license, can to can uh, buy and purchase. Um, and it is one of the problems right now because it, it obviously impacts the industry in a bad way when you have someone that may not have the right experience or licensing being able to get their hands on products like that. Uh, unfortunately, with the web, it's really I think hard to control that. Um, I do think there needs to be a, a better job of doing that. Um, 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't have, I don't, I don't personally have a, uh, a way of resolving that at the moment, but I know it is a, it is an issue. So I can, I can add to that, Ron and Matt. So that's a great question. That is a loophole for an e-commerce platform that the regulators haven't caught up to that yet. So they can regulate a, uh, a site one location or a distributor local location or, or an end user buying it from a distributor. But when it comes to the e-commerce platform, that's a loophole that's unfortunately needs to, to get to the regulators you know, attention to kind of mitigate this. Because if it is a restricted use pesticide, um, a homeowner or someone that's not licensed should not and we, we agree on this, a lot of manufacturers, you know, agree on this, and that's a loophole that, uh, that's definitely, uh, that needs to be fixed. Yeah, the question was uh, surrounding, just a follow-up from Don, he said they're buying Talstar, and um, he's in South Carolina, um, but I, I know that, you know, Talstar or, or um, some of the other bifen containing products are available, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Uh, online. So yeah, that is a problem for the industry for sure. Okay, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to jump in and type in the quiz link into the chat box. It's a survey monkey link. Again, this will take maybe three minutes. Um, we can continue this discussion. And if there are more questions, Please, we'll answer as many as we can. Um, just click on that link and take the quiz while we're going over any uh, final thoughts. Put it in there again, just in case. And um, yeah. At the end of the day, um, just to follow up on the, the whole online thing, we would much rather have professionals applying our product that limits the liability as a manufacturer um, to, to make sure that you guys uh, are the professionals in the industry that are applying our products. So um, we hear you on that. Um, unfortunately, sometimes people sell things sideways out of our, our um, hands. And at that point, then it's, uh, it, it's hard to, to keep that in line. Oh, thank you. I'd like to thank Brian again for uh, accepting to join us on, on this uh, first Friday webinar. So, Brian, great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, FMC, for having me. And uh, it was awesome just having the opportunity to talk through this. So thanks.